Got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow. Got the string around my finger. What a world, what a life. I'm in love. And good evening, everybody. I'm Tom. This is the Color Cast, up and running now for Tuesday night. It's the 18th of October, 1994. We have an all-star show tonight. We are pleased to welcome to our stage Mr. Burt Reynolds, who has been one of America's great stars for nearly three decades now. And the funny thing is, is that during my career off and on, I have seen Burt Reynolds in a variety of venues. I've seen him at parties. I've seen him outside of 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York. I've seen him walking the streets of Beverly Hills here in Southern California. Uh, I saw him riding by one time when I was in Jupiter, Florida doing radio, and I've never had the chance to sit down and talk with this man, and I really look forward to this tonight. And I hope that we can have a productive conversation about all the good things that have happened in Burt Reynolds' life, and all the good things he has brought to theater and Jupiter, to people all across America, and to his own life, rather than some of the negative programs that have been done about Burt Reynolds on other talk venues recently, if you know what I mean. Geez, I don't know what happened on The Tonight Show last night, but I'm falling asleep. And all of a sudden, I hear Burt Reynolds saying something to, uh, to a guy from cable TV. He was here. I forget his name off the top of my head. It, it's like 12.15 last night, and I'm watching The Leno Show because Dave was in repeat, and it was their salute to Kathy Lee. <laughs> 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 Which we'll do here before we wind up. And all of a sudden, my, uh, like there are pies going through the air and stuff. I don't know what that was all about, and I don't want to get into it here. I want calm and, and peace and quiet on tonight's color cast. So quiet you can hear the ratings dropping out there. <laughs> you know, I bumped into Dave Thomas coming out of the men's room. No kidding. He was in the 58 Pontiac. Come on. <laughs> Dave is here tonight. Hey, Dave's got chili at Wendy's now. Did you know that? He's got baked potatoes and chili and cheese and hot sauce. And he brought a whole bunch for us. And this may be Belcharama tonight by the time we get through. So Burt, Burt Reynolds and, and Dave Thomas on tonight's color cast. Now today, uh, stage manager Mark uh, was out with the crew uh, doing a report for Money Tonight, is that correct? correct. Uh, on Monday night starring Janice Lieberman. Correct. And apparently this was uh, uh, something called the Wonder Bra Challenge. Have you heard about this thing, folks? This is called the Wonder Bra. Uh, Mark tells me it comes in a variety of decorator colors. Uh, a variety of sizes and shapes, yes, to be sir. sure. And, uh, and basically what the Wonder Bra does, if I get the information correctly, and if I don't correct me, please, yes, sir. it lifts uh, and it shapes. You are Is correct. that correct? Okay. And from what Mark tells me, the before and after from women that sampled the Wonder Bra at our expense, CNBC's expense, yes, sir. the results were truly amazing yep. and cheaper than surgery, yes, sir. to use your words. Yes, sir. And what about the women who, were they delighted with their appearance? Absolutely. So you'll see this on Monday tonight, on Monday night, uh, with Janice Lieberman at whatever time that thing comes on. That's right. And do they have a wonder jock? Not yet, Not sir, yet. but in development. <laughs> Put a potato in your shorts, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, Michael Horowitz and I are so excited because tonight when we finish the color cast, we're going to go to the airport and take the overnight plane to NYC. Tomorrow night's show will feature Susan Lucci, and Diane Carroll from Fort Lee, New Jersey, and CNBC. We'll also be in Fort Lee on Thursday, and then on Friday, I get to go back to NBC and be on the air with uh, Conan O'Brien. Oh. They're at 12.30 at night, right? Yep. And uh, I'm gonna go to the theater in New York, and I'm gonna see some friends, and I'm gonna have some color teenies, and I always love going back to the Big Apple, and I hope everybody's given my regards to Broadway, because tomorrow morning at 6.30 in the morning, I'll be at Times Square signing pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, in the, in the morning paper today, there was a, uh, there was a joke. They, they print this column of jokes, and I thought that this one was especially cute. And when I tell it, I know it'll, it'll die out here like a sack full of dead babies, but I'm going to tell it anyway because I thought that it, it was a very, very cute joke. A man walks into a cocktail lounge, and there at the bar is a beautiful young lady dressed in a very tight, very form-fitting, very alluring, very revealing pantsuit. And he walks over to the young lady. He says, excuse me. He said, you look absolutely wonderful in that form-fitting pantsuit. He said, let me, if I could just ask you a question. Um, how does one even begin to get into a pantsuit like that? And she said, well, a martini might be a good start. 
<laughs> kind of cute, huh? Yeah. Fire up a color teeny. Watch out for the gal in the pantsuit and watch the pictures as they fly through the air. <laughs> we are back and joined by Burt Reynolds. Uh, you know, in this business, there are stars and there are superstars. And by any definition of the word, Burt Reynolds is a superstar. Uh, from his early work on the television series like Gunsmoke and Dan August to blockbuster hit films like Deliverance and Smokey and the Bandit series, not to mention the headlines he made with his romances with some of the most fabulous women in Hollywood, this man has captured audiences around the world for nearly three decades. Bert is now an author, and his newest work is called uh, My Life, Bert Reynolds, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him here during... Burt Reynolds Week in America. <laughs> I've seen you on so many shows. I'm on Bowling for Dollars <laughs> right after I leave here. Uh, you know, I, I think that that is the big mistake that you make when you do these things. Is that There has to be a lot of people out there who say, I'd like to buy the book, but I'm so sick of him now after seeing him <laughs> everywhere I turn on the television that, you know, you can turn people off. But fortunately, I have a change of clothes for every show and, and a different story. You know what's interesting about you is, is you know that conning people doesn't work. You're very smart to realize that by this time people have seen you with Jay Leno and with whomsoever else you've been on with. I guess you were on the Mary Lou Henner show yesterday, which will mm -hmm. still come on tape. And how much can you talk about before it becomes so repetitious that people say there's nothing more to hear? You can't. What I, but, but fortunately, uh, you know, I have this incredible photographic memory of things I've never done. <laughs> so I can talk about anything. <laughs> you, said, you said something one night about me. Someone was, I think it was the fat guy and the skinny guy you had on, you know, the, the two reviewers and, uh, in New York. And, and uh, they ran a, a clip of a movie in which they were, as usual, destroyed. I think it was the end. And you, and you said, but he's funny. Yeah. He's funny. And they said, this is beside the point. <laughs> I didn't think it was in a comedy. I thought that was important. That's the purpose, is to be the funny. You know, it was, it was the only movie ever done about death that ever made money. It made, made about $40 million, and, and I was rather proud of it. But uh, the fat guy and the skinny guy, who, who, who will go on? You know, no, in, what? In what? We all know who you're talking about. It's we do? It's Cisco and Ebert. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. And I never, I never got their names because I didn't care. See, I, I just go on. Yeah, declare victory and move forward. I move forward. The but fact me, that they don't like me, they have no taste. Let me ask you a question here about what people might perceive as hostility. Hostility? In Burt Reynolds. No, there is no hostility. Okay. There's just a, a f honesty and sometimes maybe, maybe a wait, I'm working here. Uh, once in a while, a once in a while, a little what some people perceive as hostility is just me having somebody on and having fun. Because years ago, I used to lose my temper, <clears throat> and it cost me <clears throat> so much money <laughs> that I don't I don't hit anybody anymore. Uh -huh. I'm losing my voice. I'm getting old. Uh, no, I hit a guy once who was a director who still go nameless and. And I, I felt so bad about it. And I went to the trailer. I felt so bad about it. I said, I'm going to go back and apologize to that guy. Would and when I got people, back, what, they body chalked him. Would, would you? <laughs> I'm sorry for talking on it. But would you like a glass of water? Are you okay? I'm fine. Oh, all right. No, you, you know the Heim, Heimlich movement. I'm fine. I'm fine. Last night, you were talking with uh, Jay Leno. Sort of. And, <laughs> yeah. And you talked about the negatives a little bit but what touched me was when you talked about the people in america the country between los angeles and new york the country that lives I in reality in jupiter and south florida from whence you come and, f and, mm -hmm. and where your family is and where you've done much to help people who want to do theater and i want you to talk to me about those people and that america because when we get away from the fat guy and the thin guy mm -hmm. we get away from the from the sharpshooters and the backstabbers and the jealous people in hollywood most of america loves burt reynolds America likes you a great deal, and I and I would think you would take great pride in that, and 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 I do take great I, comfort I, I, in that. Not more than pride. Uh, it's um, it has sustained me, but I had been away from that. I'd, I hadn't been on the road in years. Dinah Shore said something to me years and years ago that was 
uh, so touching and, and, and everything she said to me, I, I wish that I, I could remember sometimes when I do say something bad because there's a little voice up there that does tell me to say something else and it's her voice. But she said, you know, you're, you're always going to be Peck's bad boy. And every five years, you're going to get spanked. By the public, too. But that thing looks inside you. And they like you. They really like you. And, and that'll never go away. And when I went out across the country, having been down, down in Jupiter for a long, long time, and having been in every rag sheet in the country for two and a half years, accused of everything but smelling bicycle seats, you know. Uh, but here I was in... in Jeez. It's true. Jeez. It's true. That was you are graphic. I'm no, it's true. It's, it's what they do. And, and I, I went across the country, and people said things like, I've been praying for you, and I love you, my whole family loves you, I grew up with you, or whatever, and, and you're, you're, you never went away. What is all this talk about going? You're, you've always been way up here. You know? And I, they thought I was nice, to spend five and a half hours signing things. I said, you don't understand. You're putting me back together and how touching this for me. Okay, and so for all those good things, why do you let the little, the, the, the chip shots from the fat guy and the thin guy or the, all that, I don't. all that stuff, I'm I not, like I'm not even gonna it. dignify what they print in those rags uh, by even repeating it, but why, why, even res why even respond to it? Why even get upset about it? I don't. And incidentally, by the way, you're not the first high-profile guy in this town who's Why ever are you gone... getting angry? I'm not. I, I, who, who's uh, gone he's through... He's raising his voice at me now. No, no. You, but you're not the first guy in this town who's ever gone through a high-profile divorce. A lot of people have done that. A, so, lo a lot of people have. I think it was Desi and Lucy. Sure. Natalie and Bob. Sure. And life went on. Sun came up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The problem is that when you're the top of the wedding cake, you disappoint people. I didn't realize how much. And they get angry with you because it was, you know, it was like Abbott and Costello, you know, or, you know, and you couldn't mention one name without the other. And when you break up with that person, which is a very private reason, and I, I, I'm not here to put her down. She's not here to defend herself, and that wouldn't be fair. But whatever the reasons are, you separate. My son put it best. I had read all these books about how to tell him I was getting divorced. They have books for everything. I know they do. How to talk to Tom Snyder. There's <laughs> books everywhere. And you know, it's I, funny. A guy called me here the other night, and he was going through a divorce, and he, uh, there was somebody here who had some expertise on this. And he said, what do you say to a, to a 10, 11-year-old kid, you know, when your marriage is splitting up? You know, and that happened to me, and uh, it happened to you, and that's the tough happened part. to Charles Carroll. Yeah. Well, I said to my son a, a bunch of stuff that didn't sound very good. Anyway, he looked up. He was five, then. He looked up at me and said, Dad, the dance is over. And I went, I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that, Quentin. How well put. And, you, know, and you go out together, and you dance, and you're together, and then you go away, and one goes this way, and one goes that. But I said, the most important thing for you to remember always is that your dad loves you more than life. And he's never forgotten that. So we're going to be all right. But he really said that, the dance is the over? Dance is a five-year-old? He does things like that. Wow. You know what he did in the earthquake? It was no. extraordinary. No. He was with me uh, when we had the earthquake, and, and he had a substitute nanny who was not real good. And, and the earthquake came, and I, you know, as we all do, uh, uh, jumped through hoops for your children and ran through glass. And I got him, and I got under this big archway, and, and the nanny came out, and, and she had just gone ballistic and was screaming and yelling and hollering, and, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And I, I very quietly said to her, listen, just button up, okay? Now get it together, because he takes it off of you. Keep your mouth shut, okay? Fine. Next came the aftershock. She went ballistic again, and Quentin said, hey, button it up. Get it together. I take it off of you. <laughs> <laughs> what a great kid. What a kid. Oh, what a great kid. No, he's terrific. What a chip, by the way, huh? Right off the block. Yes. We are with Burt Reynolds. The book is called My Life, the Autobiography. Back with Burt and your phone calls along the toll-free highway at uh, 745 We will continue after these announcements. This is CNBC.
We are back with Burt Reynolds, whose book is called My Life. On the phone here is Della in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hello. Hi. Hi, Della. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How's, how's everything in Utah tonight? Oh, just wonderful. Well, that's I good. I just want to tell you, I like your show real well. Well, thank and you. I can remember when you was in New York with the coal black hair. Well, the coal black hair is gone, <laughs> but the fire still burns in the furnace, Della. That's right. Yeah, here's Bert. He's right. right here. Say hi to Bert. Hi. Hi, Bert. I just wanted to tell you, we sure enjoy Evening Shades. It's such a nice show, and wondering what your future plans are for making any more movies, or... I'm planning on, uh, oh, well, I just did a movie called The Maddening, where I, I play a, first time I've ever played a, a killer. Oh. I just made believe everyone was lawyers. And uh, <laughs> it's one of my better performances, actually. Angie Dickinson and I, and it was directed by John Huston's son, uh, who's a wonderful young man, and that'll be out in a couple of months. And I'm also debating about doing another television series or another sitcom or whatever. But, you know, that cast was so extraordinary that w I got spoiled. W would you ever do this chat talk? Pardon? No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking uh, Bert, and then I'll ask you, Della, because if well, you want to, you can, Andrew too. Della could do that in, in Utah. Are you a Mormon, Della? Yes, I am. Could I come to your basement when things get really rough here? I'm a very good LDS person. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love Mormons. Uh, actually, I was asked to do a show, uh, a couple of talk shows. One which turned out to be Oprah. And again, another smart move on my part. I thought, I don't no. want to be in Chicago no. and talk to people. And uh, <clears throat> isn't she the richest uh, person yes, she in is. the world now? Yes, and she is. And one of the most influential. But I would have had to wear a dress and, and be black. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I, I don't mind that. But I don't know. But not in Chicago. Not in Chicago. <laughs> she is absolutely an extraordinary woman. And, and the love that people have for her is because, again, that thing kind of looks right. It does. Does. And, and what and else she fell, does? And they fell in love with her. She, and they she, were right. She feels on camera. She's not oh. ashamed to show how she no, feels. She, Most she people hide it, but she does people and hugs people that are yeah. hurting and yeah. all that. I couldn't have done what she did in, uh, uh, nearly as well. But to answer your question, Yes, I have been asked to do it, and and if I, <clears throat> if I wanted to do something like that, I suppose I could have a shot at it. The the key, as you know better than anybody, is and it's also the key to a good young actor. You is is the hardest thing to teach them is how to listen. Most of them don't listen, or the most interviewers are are waiting or racing you to the joke, like Robin Williams, and and you're not they're not talking to you, they're not listening to you. And, and your job is not only to, to get the best out of me, I hope, but also it is to find something out that maybe somebody didn't get. Mm -hmm. Della, I'm glad you called. Thank you. God bless you, Della. Uh, thank you. It's nice talking to you. you, you uh, we too. really enjoy your show. Thank you very much, Della. Uh -huh. All right. Bye-bye now. You mentioned a name uh, before the break, and I'd like to ask you about her uh, in reverence, because I loved her so dearly, and I interviewed her several times, and that's Dinah, who was probably uh, one of the classiest, if not the classiest women who ever, people who came through this town. And I know that you, you and she were dear friends, I believe, to the end of her life. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> it was the toughest part of the book for me. And, and I did the book on uh, tape recently. We got to that section, and. And I was just sailing through it, and, and I fell apart. And, and I, I said, I'll be all right. And I went outside and came back and fell apart again. You know, the, the most extraordinary thing about her was I never, ever heard her say an unkind word about anybody, ever. And her, her sensitivity to what was right, what was wrong, and what a laugh she had. And, and, and you know, this is, this is Dinah. I, I had... When we started to go together, we I decided we'd live together, and I, she didn't like my kitchen. So I, I ended up at her house, and she had a, a, a trophy case with 22 Emmys in it or something like that. And I had my Rotary Club football trophy. And do <coughs> and you know that the next day when I came home, they were all gone, and my Rotary Club football trophy was there, surrounded by things that complimented it. Candles, I think. Yeah. And uh, that was Dinah. And every night, we would, if we didn't go somewhere, she would sing. And, and uh, 
made me feel, which is absolutely, totally uh, impossible, that I could sing too. You know, and I would sing with her, and, and then we would go on Fridays or Saturday nights to Jack Benny's house, and yeah. David Niven would be there, and Peter Ustinov, yeah. and Groucho Marx, and they'd all tell stories, and I'd say, they're real good. Yeah. And then I'd say, it's my turn. I'd like to tell you about Reed Darvel. He's a wonderful guy. <laughs> and uh, they actually let me but do now, that. Listen to you. You loved her, didn't you? I loved her more than anyone in the world. And uh, I, 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 I should have married her. Why I, didn't you marry her, Bert? Because I was a damn fool. Because uh, I listened to a lot of people that I shouldn't have. And you know, when you're young, you have this thing about... It's so... I, I'm ashamed to say this, but it's about passing on, it's so, it's so embarrassing, passing on, you know, uh, your lineage, another Burt Reynolds, etc. what an ass I was. Who needs another one? And, and, uh, and, and when you adopt a child, as, as I did or we did, uh, it took four days, and he couldn't be more my son if you ripped him out of my ribs. I love him so much. We could have, uh, I, I was just a fool. And, and we talked every once a week from the time we separated, uh, uh, a week before she died. And I said, can I please come over to see you? And she said, I'm so fat, and I gotta get in shape for this golf tournament. And she wasn't fat at all. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, I love her. I gotta stop for a second here for commercials. Back with Burt Reynolds and a couple of you on the toll-free line as time permits right after these messages. Stay with us, folks. It's a wonderful story. Back, gang. Burt Reynolds is here tonight. The book is called My Life. It's in the bookstores everywhere. And here is Stu on the toll free from Orlando, Florida. Hello. Hi, Tom. Hi, How Stu. You? How you doing? Uh, the reason I'm calling, I figure since uh, the Burt Man is there, and actually it's Stu from Orlando in the home of a mouse house. Anyway, my question mouse house, you know. <laughs> yeah, the mouse house. Right. Any, hey, anyway, Stu, we got it. <laughs> all right. We got it, Stu. I'm, I'm on a two-minute, two-second delay. Anyway, the question for the Burt man over there, I'm going to ask him something that I think he's an expert on, and let's talk about Gator and Seminole football. Well, I'm not an expert on it. I can tell you this, though. Uh, yeah, throw, he, throw the hurricanes in there, too. No, I'd rather not. Uh, <laughs> actually... What people don't understand is, and especially Gators and Hurricanes, is that I cheer for them every game but one. You got it. And, and that game is when they play Florida State. And Bobby Bowden is an extraordinary man uh, and uh, has finally got to be number one. He used to say to me, buddy, you don't know how to talk to the media. Now, I get along great with the media. What you got to do is just start a story and just don't finish it, boy. You just tell that story, you just get to talking, and then finally the time is up. And you got him, you know what I mean? Just love him and talk him, be funny, you know, just be a good old boy. I said, Bobby, it doesn't work that way. They got an agenda. I mean, they come, they know what they're going to write. And all that. I know you're great with the media, but, well, guess what? I got a phone call from Bobby after they got to be number one, and he said, they're killing me. I said, it comes with the territory, Bobby. When you got to be number one, see, they had problems down there, major problems. Boys were actually going and getting free tennis shoes. Dear God, twenty-two dollars worth. And wow! So we had to we had to come down on them. Sports Illustrated wrote some of the most unbelievable, tough articles on Florida State and Bobby Bowden, who is he's the best thing that ever happened to college football. This is a man that took uh, athletes from thirty percent graduation to seventy percent graduation. So let's knock them. Let's put him down. Let's rip him to shreds. Well, he's number one. I know. That's what happens. You see, if Nebraska had kicked that field goal, they would have had problems in Nebraska last year in the mall. 
There you go, Stu. Hope you enjoyed the ride. The, the thing is, Tom, I've got a question for you. A lot of people call there and they want mugs and one thing and another from yeah. you. But what I'm going to do is offer you a choice. I'll either send you a mug or a keychain. What would you like? I'll take the keychain, thank You'll you. will take the keychain. Yes, sir. I'll take the mug. Send well, Bert the mug. Wait a minute. Where do, where do I send the, each of these things? You send them Tom to, will give you his home address. You, you send them to me here at CNBC, and I'll make sure that Bert gets it over at the house. Okay. If he's now, still Bert there. Wants a mug, right? Yes, Bert, sir. Yeah, that's the mug for Bert and the keychain for All Tom. All right. Now, you can tell Bert that the mug he's going to get. No, no. You, you don't have to tell me to tell him, Stu. You can tell him I yourself. I can hear you. Right. Yeah. It will say, Go Gators. And in November, you know, we got you, boy. Yes, I know you do. Okay, Stu. Stu. And right, that's what you thought one. last week, didn't you? <laughs> and Auburn got you. It was Stu, in Bowden, too, by the way. Stu, glad you called. <laughs> I want to I wanna ask you here when you went to Benny's house, because I, it's the one on Roxbury, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and I walk by there most mornings. What a wonderful house that is. And oh, I okay. often wondered what, was, what it was like when he and Mary Livingston were living there. It was extraordinary. And he was the best audience. Really? Yeah. yeah. You know, most comedians are not great audiences. And... I shouldn't generalize about that, but most of them I've met. I mean, Milton Burrow, you tell him a, a joke and you think it's funny, and he goes, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> Jack Benny, you could tell Jack Benny a joke, and he would fall on the really? floor. Fall on the floor. And the first time that I met him, I was standing there talking to him, and Georgie Jessel came by. Now, for you folks out there who are too young, Georgie Jessel had a hairpiece that looked like a golf divot landed on his head. <laughs> and, and it, it really, and sometimes it was backwards, and sometimes it was forwards, and sometimes it was over here. Yeah, yeah. And he hair, had a year from for men and Jessel yeah. never met. No, no, no. <laughs> this, this, this was bad. It was, and, and he ha always had a uniform, which we don't know from what army it was from, with lots of medals, which we don't know how he got them. <laughs> yeah, right. And Remember, he, had a, he looked like a general. He had yeah. hundreds of medals. <laughs> yeah. And, and always a girl not over 17. Okay? <clears throat> so he would walk by. And Mr. Benny said, Bert, do you think George still does it? <laughs> and I said, yes, I, I know for a fact that he does, because I know that young lady. He does do it, but it's dust. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. It was a true story, actually. <laughs> The dust wasn't red, was it? No, no. Oh, okay. Wait, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, after I got him up off the floor, we, we went into dinner, and he said, Bert, tell a story. You know. I'll tell you, you're, you, you ought to do this. You're, you're a very entertaining man, and I appreciate your giving us some of your time tonight. I know you probably get sick to death of talking about this stuff, but no, I, for the I, well, I, we didn't talk about this stuff, and, and you are uh, so kind to say that. And you, you had somebody on here, and I called in, as you know, Jim Neighbors. That's correct. Uh, just one quick story about Jim Neighbors, who's one of the kindest, dearest men in the world. When some very smart idiot wrote a, a marriage proposal between or a marriage announcement between Rock Hudson and Jim Neighbors. It ruined his career. He was dropped and at that time he had the third highest show on CBS. He had never met Rock Hudson at the time by the way. It ruined him. Now Jim would go out and open his show in the audience and then come up on stage. Well he was in Dallas which is a, a tough place to play with that kind of, 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 of thing going around. And Johnny Unitas went down there. I went down there, too. And Jim didn't open in the... St he, he opened on the stage and mm -hmm. came out and he said, I'm sorry, you people. I'm sorry I disappointed y'all, but I did my best. And usually I, I end my show with this, but tonight I'm going to start with it. And he sang the Lord's Prayer. There was no response. And then Johnny Unitas, when I walked out, and Johnny Unitas said, this is one of my best friends. And he's, he's a wonderful man kind man, and I want to give him these high-top shoes that I wore when I played in supposedly the greatest game of all time. And them Texans said, by gosh, if Johnny and Nice liked him, he's all right. And everything turned around. Yeah. I just wanted to tell that story because Jim went on and has never done an interview since that time except you. Is that right? 
He was terrific that night. He's never talked to the press again except you. Well, I was glad he was here, and I hope he'll come back. And I thank you for your champ. Thanks for coming on tonight. God bless you. Jeff. Okay, God thank bless you. you back. Burt Reynolds, folks, the book is called uh, My Life. Back with Dave Thomas, the man who founded Wendy's and the incredible 58 Pontiac and the Chili and all the stuff after these messages. <laughs> Voted number one by the National Limousine Association, has offices in Los Angeles and the East Coast. Music Express can handle your corporate limousine needs anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide. We are back and joined by a man whose face is known to all Americans. It's one of the kindest faces on television, and he makes people happy in a variety of ways. Number one, by helping people in adoptions, and number two, by providing good food at his chain of restaurants called Wendy's across the land. Here is the one, the only, Dave Thomas. Thanks for coming on, Dave. I'm really happy you're here tonight. Well, thanks, Tom. I'm glad to be here. Dave is the author of Well Done, uh, a brand new book out by Dave Thomas, in which he tells a variety of stories, uh, including stories about himself and about the food business. Now, let me, let me ask you about the food you brought up here tonight, the baked potatoes and the chili. It's fantastic. I didn't say it wasn't. <laughs> is, is, is that a new item at Wendy's? No. no we've, we've had it for years. And how does it do? Very, very well. At Wendy's, we have nutrition. Right. And, you know, you can, I just lost about 35 pounds myself. Really? And um, baked potatoes and our chili, we take all the fat out of it. And, um, you know, we have salads and, and our hamburgers we cook well done. Right. And um, the reason I wondered about chili... You know, like you got your national chains of hamburger restaurants. Right. Yours is one of the leaders. You've got your hot dog restaurants. You've got your pizza chains. But there's never been a chili chain that's been successful featuring chili as the lead item. Not a hamburger, not a hot dog, not a pizza. And we figured, and you would probably know this because you're a food guy, is that chili is different in every region of the country. Uh, chili in Texas is different from chili in Ohio, is different from chili in California. It, are we onto something here, or are we well, just... Well, I think there is to a point that, you know, the difference is that we use hot sauce, and we let people put the hot sauce, and they use more hot sauce in Texas than they would in Indiana, true, for example. True, But the basic chili is the same. All over the country? All over the country. Really? And you sell it coast to coast, the same chili? Same chili, and we even sell it overseas. Even in Japan. Yeah. Like, would you ever sell it uh, frozen in grocery stores? Yeah, we might. But uh, I tried it one time with beans, and it didn't work out too well. Not good enough. No. <laughs> Had plenty of beans left. And the other thing I've often wondered is, why wouldn't one of the major airlines make a deal with a Wendy's to have certain flights that, that feature your salad? Well, they and, should. Yeah, and your baked potatoes I mean, and your chili a, and, 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 and your that's hamburgers. A, that's a great suggestion. I mean, they should do that. I mean, I, you know, a lot of times it would be nice just to get on the plane and have a baked potato or a bowl of chili rather than that stuff. Or a salad. Or, or a salad, salad, right, a salad, nutrition, yeah. right, or a well-cooked hamburger. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Of all the things that you've introduced in Wendy's restaurants, uh, and I'm, I, I don't mean to be unfair here, but what didn't work? Well, I'll tell you what didn't work. When I first started, now we're, we'll be 25 years old. Uh, November 15th, and we have 4,350 restaurants, and we do about $4 billion in sales, and we employ about 130,000 people. I started out with a single, a double, and triple hamburger made to order using fresh meat. Had chili, had a frosty, and that's uh, uh, ice cream. It's really ice cream mix, vanilla and chocolate, right. and sugar cream pie. And what happened was we didn't sell very, very much of it, but I eat. I ate a lot of sugar cream pie. Had to take it off the menu. And, and why didn't it work? Did you ever find out why? I don't know. I mean, I liked it. I liked it too well, in fact. <laughs> and why are Wendy's hamburgers square and the other ones are round? Well, Tom, we don't want to cut corners. <laughs> and, and, it, and, it's, and it's really, what it is is really operational. Right. And we cook and, and um, you know, we do everything to make hamburgers fresh. And that's how, how I started with that concept. But I want to tell you about my book also. Okay. Well done. There's Well Done is a book about 70 different people and how successful they are and what they have done in their lives. You know, being adopted myself, right. my mother died when I was five years old, and I've been on my own since I've been 15 years old. 
and uh, I was had a little rocky start. I was born out of wedlock and never seen my mother and father, my biological mother and father. Um, I've always been curious, why are people successful? How do they stay successful? Mm -hmm. yeah. And in this book, um, I have all kind of people, from actors to, to um, uh, preachers to entrepreneurs and and um, social workers and is, adoptees. Is, is there a thread that runs through the lives of all the people that you profile or most of them in Well Done it, it, that would give is. us some clue as to why certain people are successful? I'll tell you why. Basically, they're God-loving people. Secondly, they, they're honest, they have integrity, they do the right things, and they help people. They help people, they put their self second and people first. And um, you know, for example, Lee Majors is a good friend of mine. Sure. And Lee uh, is, um, it was adopted, and didn't know that he was adopted till he was 12 years old. As I was, I didn't know I was adopted till I was 13 years old. And I got to give him a plug because he's got a big special on CBS, November 1st. The Bionic Woman and the Six Million Dollar Man, they marry. And I'm. I'm in it, a cameo. I'm in there for about two seconds. What, do you come in and say, where's the beef? Or, you know? No, no. He's got me in a basement. I'm captured, and he was going to get me out, but his bionic arm didn't work. Then I had to leave, so I don't know. Now, but I do have a little speaking part, because last night when I come here, Lee asked me to do a little looping, and so I had to say, Steve, I'm going to be okay. So, and, and that's your line, right? That's my line. That's Steve, the whole line. Okay. Hey, you did it well here tonight. <laughs> I didn't have to do too many takes. Yeah. Back uh, here in just a couple of seconds, I have a commercial waiting back with Dave Thomas and your phone calls along the toll-free line. The book is called Well Done, the Stories of Successful People. We'll be right back, folks. If you'd like to purchase a VHS copy of the preceding program, please send 1995 plus 350 shipping and handling with the name, air date, and subject of the program to Burrell's, P.O. Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039. For credit card orders, please call 1-800-777-8398. We're back with Dave Thomas, uh, who is the author of Well Done. Was How tough was it for you to become the spokesman for your restaurants? You know, a lot of people don't, don't like to hawk their own wares. Well, I'm cheap. No, you're not. You, oh. pay, uh, you paid Clara Peller a lot of money for Where's the Beef. By the way, what a campaign that was. Oh, she was a fantastic lady, but passed away. Yeah. You know, just, um, I, you know, Tom, I've done about 300 commercials. Really? And I don't think I ever got one right yet. Because my director keeps saying... You know, cut, cut, one more time. And just be yourself. And his, his name's Billy Hudson, and he's a fantastic person. But uh, I just go there, and somebody says, well, you must be getting better. I don't think I get getting any worse, but I'm not sure I'm getting any better. But, like, do people come up to you on the street and say, hey, Dave, how are you? Oh, they'll ask me all kind of questions. Is it really you? Yeah. I say, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure, but so they all ask all kind of questions. Yeah. You know, uh, how's your daughter, Wendy? Uh, is it really you in them commercials? Yeah, it's really me. And, and, and tell me about your work here with, with uh, I, I know you're very big on adoption. Well, what I'm really asking people to do, and it started back about four years ago with President Bush at the White House, is put, a, and he asked me to go out and ask corporate America to put adoption benefits in. You know, like, for example, you have maternity benefits, you should add adoption benefits. And uh, yeah, why with, not? Yeah. Uh, and it's it's real simple. And kids uh, a kid, right? Yeah. Governor Campbell of South Carolina, I spoke to the governor's conference in January, and South Carolina put adoption benefits in. Columbus, uh, Ohio, the city put adoption benefits in. And Ohio, uh, George Vonovich put uh, yeah. yeah. Governor Vonovich put uh, adoption benefits in. So I think what I'm really trying to do is get everyone that has Paternity benefits, put adoption benefits in. And all the proceeds of my book is going to go to adoption for the foundation. You know, you're a heck of a guy, Dave. I want to tell you something. That's very, very good. Well, I you think know, it's the right uh, thing hey, to do. Well, it is the right thing. You know, and I was adopted, and, you know, I think everyone deserves a home and love, so. Did you ever find your real mom and dad? I, I found my grandmother and grandfather, but my mother and dad both were passed, passed mm -hmm. away. And, um, you know, I got ch cheated, but uh, one thing that I started out a little rocky, but I was lucky for one thing. I was born in America, in a land of opportunity, and I've really been so lucky. You know, I thank God every day that uh, that I'm American. Yeah, but I'll, be, I'll bet the harder you work, the luckier you got. 
Well, I did that. Yeah. yeah I, I, you know, I just believe if you yeah. didn't, uh, in a little philosophy. Yeah. If you, you know, if you didn't work, you didn't eat. And I think that should apply today for those that don't want to work. And, um, you know, I just like to eat too well. Still do. I know. I know. <laughs> Here is Sarah joining us on the toll-free from Abilene, Texas. Hello. Hi, Tom. Well, How are you doing? Good evening, Sarah. I'm doing well, and thanks for calling our show tonight. Thanks. Um, is Dave there, please? Yes, I am. Hi, Dave. How you doing? Great. Um, I was wondering, uh, you've been doing these Wendy's commercials now for a long time, and I was wondering, obviously, Wendy is still alive, and I was wondering how old she is, and um, what is she doing now? Well, I've been doing commercials for going on five years, about 300, and Wendy is, uh, I have four daughters and a son, and Wendy lives in Dallas, and she's a franchisee. She's 33 years old, and I hope I'm right, because if I'm not, she's going to shoot me. She has uh, three children, and uh, two boy, two girls and a boy, and, and a set of twins. I mean, it's, it's just three all together. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I kind of got that. Yeah, Wendy, yeah. forgive me. Yeah, and, and, and like Wendy is the one after whom the restaurants are named, right? right? Right, So how do the other kids feel that the restaurants ain't named after them? Well, w what happened was, um, her name's Melinda, but she hates for me to say that. Yeah. But her... Uh, but after all, she is a franchisee, so... <laughs> yeah, she, that's right. And her sister, uh, Pam, and her uh, brother, Kenny, and her sister, Molly, couldn't say Melinda, and they called her Wenda. And so I went home one night, and I had the menu all set. I wanted to make a fresh hamburger made to order. That's the way we do it now. And... Chili, you know, frosty. You know, the the frosty, thing. the baked potato, right. the salad. Right? Well, we didn't have the baked potato then because nutrition come in, but it would give a lot of choices. And I said, I'm going to call it Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers. And uh, that, that's, that, that that's was it, a, huh? That's the whole deal. I, I mean, it wasn't pick the other names out of a hat, no, and the others, no, and it was Wendy's. No, huh? no marketing people, no hocus pocus groups, consultants. Focus, I just, research, none I of that. Just, no. Fresh hamburgers, going to be called Wendy's. That's pretty and much quality's it. Quality's our recipe. Qu quality's a recipe. Got it. Anything else, Sarah? Yes, Tom. I have a couple of questions for you. Well, go, go right ahead, ma'am. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I, I think it, your show is great and everything, and I watch you every night. Thank you. And I will uh, watch you tomorrow night for the info that I'm, the questions that I'm fixing to ask you. And I was wondering if, see, I'm a key, big key for cups. Big Kiefer Sutherland's fan, and I was wondering if he ever been on your show before. No, he's so never been will here. Will he be on your show? We're trying to book him, but we haven't had any luck yet. Okay. Well, um, I'll be watching tomorrow night if he can get some info on it. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. I appreciate that. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, who's your biggest competitor, do you think? Ourselves. Really? Yeah. We, what we try to do is have clean restaurants, you know, be nice to everyone, get the order right, and food safety is a really an important thing. Oh, sure it is, too. yeah. And, you know, and price has got to be right. So we take care of one customer at a time. And when we don't do that, we're our biggest competitor. Well, I sure thank you for coming on tonight, Dave. I've seen you on all the commercials. Oh, I, thank I, you. I, I lust for your 58 Bonville convertible. Do, do you really have that car? No, we lease it. <laughs> <laughs> like, could I get it for just a weekend sometime? I think we can work that out. Okay. I sure appreciate your coming by. Well, thank you. The uh, best to you and your family. And, and really, thanks for all the work that you have done to make people aware of the needs of kids who are adopted. Well, everyone and, deserves a home. And their moms and dads. Thanks yeah. a million, Dave. Thank Dave you. Thomas, folks, the book is called Well Done. It looks like this right here. Back tomorrow night, same time, same station, out of Fort Lee, New Jersey, with Susan Lucci and Diane Carroll. Drive safely on the way home. Stay tuned for Berkowitz, and good night, everybody.